1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, and uh, we'll be looking at a verse there in just a little bit. But uh, this study comes by way of a, another pastor who, um, who asked uh, about uh, these uh, various uh, things uh, with regard to evil, and that's why the whole first hour uh, of this study, this is part two, uh, we went into that. We're going to have just a little bit of review of that because people don't seem to understand. They don't seem to to know or to realize just what evil is and uh, and how others can be good. And yet um, uh, you have somebody say, well, yeah, they might be th that good and they're nice people and, and moral and all that, supposedly moral uh, and all that. And yet you call them evil, and uh, that's exactly what the Bible calls them. And uh, there is a reason for that, of course. When Adam and Eve sinned, they full well understood the nature of evil. Did Adam and Eve want the curse? No. Uh, did Adam and Eve want to retain the domination of the garden? Yes. Did they want to live in paradise? Absolutely. They just didn't want to have God there telling them what to do. Uh, uh, were they visiting bars and taking drugs and that? No. Uh, did they commit that particular sin as the, the first sin, the original sin? They did not. The first sin was God said, don't eat of the tree. And Lucifer said, do eat of the tree. And they believed Lucifer. God said, you'll surely die. And Lucifer said, you'll not surely die. The first sin was a theological sin and a sin that, uh, that uh, doubted and, uh, and cast a shadow upon the integrity of God. And so that's what the essence of evil is. And so anybody in this world, doesn't matter if they're a so-called minister, it doesn't matter if they're a politician, doesn't matter who they are. If they are attempting to live their life bringing maximum good to themselves, but God out of their lives, they are status quo evil. That's what evil is. And so uh, it's not that it doesn't have its downside, or as they say in Star Wars, the dark side of the force, uh, that there is not that, there is that. But that's, that means that um, if you go to a, to a church that doesn't preach the truth, and uh, they, they talk about being good, and yet it's not the way God says it through the Apostle Paul for this dispensation. Those, those people are evil. Now, they might be pleasant people, surely. Good conversationalists, oh yes. Family members, upstanding in the community, all of those things. But they are trying to bring that about without having to do what God requires of them. And folks just can't seem to say, well, how can they be so good? How can they do such good for humanity, you know? Uh, the fact of the matter that God calls humanity lost, and that word lost there means worthy for the trash heap. <laughs> lost humanity is, is goes to hell, and Gehenna is nothing but a trash dump. That's what it is. That's, what, that's how God sees lost people. For all, for all eternity, they will be burning in a trash heap. And they're lost because that's what God calls them. They are not, not only are they unworthy, um, but, but they're lost because he can't do anything with them. And he, he considers them lost. But do lost people want to bring about the best of life apart from God? Sure. Do they want a disease-free body? Sure. Do they want to be free from hunger and thirst? Well, absolutely. Do they want to have the means to party and, and have a good job? Oh, yes, they do. They want to bring all that goodness for themselves out. But do they want to have God tell them, you must believe in Christ, you must be filled with the Spirit, you must learn the Word of God? No. That's why uh, you, you don't have uh, many people who come uh, to, to churches that study the Word of God. Uh, because they don't understand that the essence of evil is good without God. And goodness without God means that you don't do what God requires of you for that dispensation. Now, the problem with evil is that it's the tree of the knowledge of good. It's not that man doesn't know something. He knows how to be good. And, uh, and you, you can identify uh, some of these people. And as a, as a matter of fact, even as saved people, you can admire some of them for their achievements. Uh, some of them are well-educated. Some of them have toughed it out and made it to the top. Some of them are, are successful uh, uh, 
beyond the the norm and we can appreciate their struggles a a person uh, who wants standards and excellence in their own life can see it in others even if that other person is unsaved but you must also recognize that they're bringing about good with the knowledge of good they got when adam sinned the knowledge of good is part of the original sin and the condemnation of the entire race they're good without god but what happens? Well, whenever you're good without God, it produces two things. One, good, which is relatively good. We call that, of course, over here, we'll just put a minus R. Because people do good things. Uh, and we could, could list it. However, all of the goodness that they're producing is self-righteousness that doesn't uh, oh, uh, add up to as far as God is concerned. But the second thing is that when they produce it, uh, they also produce good which is absolutely bad, good which is sinful. Now, the thing is, Jesus Christ did not die for goodness here. There's no place in Scripture where it says that Jesus Christ died for human good. He did not do it. By the way, if you're, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ, you're trying to produce that, that minus R, that good which is relatively good. He, he did not die for that. You're going to face it again in, in, uh, uh, in, at the end of, of history. What did he die for? He died for the result of that evil, the good which is absolutely bad, or he died for our sins, but still, uh, if we are here and we're saved and we're carnal people, do you know that we're still trying to produce good which is relatively good? Uh, carnal people are self-righteous people. Oh, we want to be nice and right and, 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 and uh, treated nice and, and the like. However, it's still minus R. The filling of the Spirit plus the application of accurate doctrine is the only plus R that God recognizes and rewards. Anything else is still minus R. And you have to, again, remember that when you produce the one, you also produce the other. But Jesus Christ did not die for these. He did, thank God, die for the, our sins. All right? Now here's the graphic that we use to, to illustrate that evil as to its result and that which is absolutely bad or sin are those things for which Christ died. But when you look at evil as a strategy, he did not die for it. Do you know that every single person in this world is status quo evil if they are good without God? But that strategy, that philosophy is the philosophy of the devil himself. And we always get this bum fuzzled. It's as though the devil wants the drink and the drugs, and we get people focused on that, on those, those more or less obvious bad things about humanity. And so we want to clean it up. What does Antichrist do? What's the first thing he does when he takes power? He goes to a temple, the Jewish temple, the very one God ordained. He sits on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat, and he declares himself God and he establishes a religion where he is God and when you worship him you get good in this world apart from the true and living God. Now Jesus Christ did not die for that strategy. Is that Antichrist strategy? Yes it is. Is that where the world is headed with the ecumenical movement? Absolutely. We have, you know, a zillion and one churches. We're coming together because we all love one another. And, uh, and our point here is simply, when you tell somebody a theological lie, you join Satan's strategy of evil and you do not love them because, because love is acting in their best spiritual and eternal behalf. Jesus Christ did not die, therefore, also for the relatively good. I heard a guy, uh, he's a part of the, the group of uh, the Habitat for Humanity, and they've reached their goal, of, exceeded their goal of building so many. And he said, and he started crying and said, I made a pact with God, and we, we exceeded this pact with God. I would tell you the, the church that he goes to, where he, he said, God, I'll build this many houses for you if you'll recognize me as good. That's what he's doing, you see. 
It's a church that, is, that has works involved in, in their salvation. Little did he know that Jesus Christ did not die for him. Jesus Christ will not redeem the strategy of evil, and Jesus Christ will not redeem that which is relatively good. He, he's not going to do it. He never did it. He won't. He, he will never die for it. However, he did to die to counteract the evil result. When Jesus Christ died, we were status quo evil, and he died so as to make it different, so that we reject evil as he rejected it, and he can counteract that with, uh, with um, his actions. He also died for that which is absolutely bad. Every sin that comes as a result of good, that's, that's, that sounds like <laughs> double talk, doesn't it? Sin as a result of good, yes. People, there, there are millions of them that are going to church today. They're going to church, and they're all good. They're all gussied up. Sunday, go to meet and close. Uh, they, they took their, them their weekly bath. They put on the, the aftershave and perfume. They went there, and, and they're, they're all good, and they polished their halo, and they're sitting there. And as they go to church, they are status quo evil, producing relative good, and they, have a, they, uh, are, are, uh, attempt, they are sinning as they do it. And none of them, none of them realize that. Christ died for evil as its result to reconcile all things back to himself. Reconcile all things that were evil back to himself. Evil is away from God. He reconciles them back to God. So any strategy, any philosophy, any type of plan or tactic that leaves God out of the life in order to produce a benefit for you or someone else is evil to the core. But uh, uh, again, as we say, he did die for that which is uh, absolutely bad, our sins. Now, where do we see our works again then? Where will the unsaved see them? At the last judgment where evil is judged. When the books are opened, and it says plural, there's a dossier, there's a portfolio, there is a file on every person. There's a book. As they live, their works are being uh, written down. Now, because they are doing works to produce good, you know that they have embraced the evil strategy. That's what evil is. And so every single person there, they're trying to do, do good, to come, you know, do, live my life, but, uh, but to, to do it my way and not God's way. That's the evil strategy. But again, their, their intent on producing something that is beneficial for themselves, they're not embracing evil uh, to hurt themselves, even though it does. They're embracing evil to get good out of it. That's what the tree is. It's the tree of the knowledge of creature good without God. And we need to drive that home into our hearts. Drive it home into our hearts. The, these people that are doing good are evil. Unless there are, there are uh, specified things that, that God says that we can do good that are not evil. That we can do good that he praises. That we can do good that he rewards. Now, what is it? Well, Jesus Christ, of course, then died for evil as a result. When we trust Christ as Savior, that is counteracted. In order to be anti-evil, you have to believe in Christ. Well, what is that? That is an action of including God in your life. Evil is excluding God for good. Uh, righteousness is including God for good. And you have shown that you recognize that human good is absolutely bad. That it is, a, it is the byproduct uh, of a relative righteousness. It is the byproduct of evil. And you reject that to the core. You realize you have no goodness in and of yourself. And so you believe uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are anti-evil. All right. Now... Let's begin looking at uh, uh, some of these things. What is the, e uh, the uh, result of evil? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, and I believe I, I did uh, say that. Um, in verse number 14.
you'll recognize here the three containers of man. The Apostle Paul specifies them as body, soul, and spirit. However, when man sinned, there was a detrimental effect on all three parts, but especially in two parts. Uh, and uh, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ um, specifies the, uh, the part of the soul when he says, whatsoever profit a man, though he gain the whole world and lose his what? His own soul. Gaining the whole world, apart from God, evil. Just getting all you can in this world, the, the, the best of this life. But you don't include God. You lose something that's more precious than ever, the wealth of this world. Your soul. And uh, so that's why he, um, he gave that illustration. Uh, and people don't, don't understand because the world's focus today is on rampant materialism. It is, it is to get, it is to acquire, it is to experience everything that the physical and material universe has. Forget God. And if we do include him, we'll include him as relative, our relative righteousness. We're doing good, God, for you to recognize us. All right. The first direct thing that happened when Adam and Eve sinned is the human spirit died. Now, I, I have uh, uh, some of these pastors ask me my opinion on, well, is, is it, there a residual spirit there? Uh, is, uh, uh, what, what is in there and, uh, and the like? Is there some sort of substance there? And I said, no. The container is... Uh, is black. It is, it is filthy because it needs the washing of regeneration and then the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, what, what does that mean? It means that that's the way the human spirit looks status quo evil. It means that every person without Jesus Christ does not have a human spirit. Well, why is that so important? This is the image of God. When God created man, he created man in his own image. What does evil do? Get rid of God's image. That's what evil does. No regeneration. Make fun of being born again. Or, or to teach a false gospel so that men think that they are saved, but they are not. And all along, they still have an empty human spirit. They think they're living life in the image of God, and it's the image of Adam, worse yet, the image of Lucifer. Uh, and uh, that's, that's where God's image is. Now, here's what happens. Verse 14. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Now, remember our study this, uh, this morning when we went uh, uh, by Matthew 13 and talked about eyes and ears. Here is the natural man, all right? The natural man is anybody, anyone. Whatever degree of refinement, sophistication, education, that doesn't have a human spirit. He's a natural man. Note what it says. He receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. Why? He doesn't have the image of God here. That's what being born again is. Being born again means that God, the Holy Spirit, renews your human spirit as it was when God created it in Adam. It's regenerated. Uh, that container is filled up with spirit in a minimal amount of truth. And so therefore, that's, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the human spirit becomes important because anybody thought a human spirit's evil. Now, they might be relatively good, <laughs> minus R, but they're still totally, completely evil. They're called a natural man. Now, know what else? Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Point. Eyes they have to see, yet they do not see. Ears they have to hear, but they do not hear. And Jesus said, blessed are your eyes, for they see. They get the point. Blessed are your ears, for they hear 
they, per, they perceive what God wants. That's the concept of blessed eyes and ears. And you have unsaved people all like, oh, I thank the Lord. They're, they're, they have no human spirit. Thank the Lord for my sight and thank the Lord for my hearing. I want to tell you, you can have sight and you can have hearing and you can have perfect health until you die. But unless you have a human spirit, your eyes are going to see but not see. Your ears are going to hear but not hear. And, and Jesus said, whatsoever a man hath is going to be taken from him. And there are going to be degrees of punishment. That, that's the, that's the, the, the works aspect back here. Uh, the book of works are, are open because there are degrees of punishment. Levels of consignment in hell. Few stripes, many stripes, according to your embracing evil as a strategy and attempting to produce relative good apart from God's system. That's the danger of it. Uh, it still all ends up in the trash heap called Gehenna or hell. Okay? Now, the second thing that, that happens is go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Now, the, the, the next thing, the, the first and most direct result of Adam's sin and embracing of evil was the rejection of the human spirit because that part is where he perceives God and can be like God. But the next part that was directly and adversely affected is the human body. So that's why Paul here, and he, he's going to address in Romans 6, 7, and 8, this aspect of this, this diamond shape here, broken uh, diamond shape, is, um, is the old sin nature. Where do we get it? Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin... So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Here's how, how, how it works, all right? When we are conceived, we get a, a human body. That comes from mom over here, dad over here. At the point of birth, God gives us a human soul. And that soul is customized to that body. But because dad corrupts the, the egg of mom at conception, the old sin nature is resident in every cell of your body in the womb. It's not active yet. Oh, why isn't it active? Well, you realize that that babe is connected to its mom. And if, it was, uh, if the old sin nature was active, mom would have to deal with how many sin natures? <laughs> Two sin natures. It's not active until the human soul is in there. I don't know about you. Uh, you know, I've, praise the Lord for my mom. Uh, but she couldn't have handled me in the womb with a sin nature. Couldn't have done it. Uh, but don't think more of yourself than you ought to think. Because she couldn't have handled it with you either. All right. But out of the womb, God breathes in soul life. But something's missing. That is, God does not breathe human spirit life in you. Because that comes by way of you. You uh, trust uh, uh, Jesus Christ as Savior or reject him as to whether or not there is the washing of regeneration, a cleaning up of this dirty, filthy human spirit and the renewing of the human spirit by the Holy Ghost. Okay, now let's uh, move then uh, on into Romans chapter 7. Now, Romans 6, 7, and 8 primarily deal with the profile of the old sin nature. Now, again, we're, we're doing this. We've, we've seen this graphic before, but I just want to remind you of it. Because folks get to thinking, well, I can live the Christian life without the filling of the Spirit. And the point is... If you do, you have embraced evil, and though you are, you pretend to be good, and you might be in certain areas, but you're still producing sin as you, as you do that. That's the danger for all of us. We're not, we're not uh, um, 
uh, assuming any sinless perfection here as we talk about this uh, because uh, the old sin nature is latent in every cell of the body. Now, the, the point is that the old sin nature has a profile. And when you look at the world today, the world today, because, because Lucifer is wanting to produce good apart from God, what is the emphasis? Well, I, I mentioned this Wednesday night. I, I was at a, a certain place and there, there was a certain uh, person there and, and we've been friends for, for a while and, and uh, this person said, well, are you and your church going to be part of, of the uh, teen fest or whatever is going to be part of the Vandenberg County thing uh, there on, um, what, what is it? When's Labor Day? Labor Day is the end of some. What is it? Memorial Day. Memorial Day. There we go. Are you going to be part of that? They're going to bring in some contemporary Christian music and they're going to teach against you know, drugs, and, and they're going to teach you uh, uh, abstinence, you know, before marriage and, and sex. And I said, you know, who are the churches involved? Well, I don't know all the church, but there, we're just, it's all the churches, you know, all the in churches. Well, what do they teach? Well, uh, I don't know. And I said, okay. Now, again, I didn't have the time, nor was it the place for me to go into a tirade here about uh, the old sin nature. To begin with, that person would never have grasped it. But could we, can we judge all things? Can we say, okay, what's the emphasis? It is here. It is to, to cross out unrighteousness, what they think is unrighteousness and to emphasize the trend of self-righteousness. The churches that she is talking about, we could name, that have nothing to do with the grace message for today. Therefore, all of their members are unsaved. Unless they're saved by Paul's message, they're unsaved. They're, yet they're church members. What is the trend? Self-righteousness. And against unrighteousness. What does that let us know? That's Lucifer's policy. He wants to bring about a world that's good apart from God. What does he have to get rid of? He's got to get rid of unrighteousness. He's got to show in the angelic conflict, he's got to show the world that I'm as competent a leader as Jesus Christ and I am better. I can get rid of unrighteousness and bring in righteousness without Jesus Christ. The Prince, the prince of Peace, the altogether lovely righteous one. I can do that. So where was the emphasis? It is not on the truth of the gospel. It is not on the right division of the word. It is all, we're going to teach these kids apart from salvation, apart from spirit filling, and apart from truth. We're going to teach them to do a few things that are uh, not to do, not teach them to do. <laughs> Teach them not to do a few things that we deem unrighteous. And again, yeah, it's unrighteous. We'll grant you that. But we want them to be self-righteous. What will that fest be? In our opinion, evil. They might get some kids off drugs and off drink. They might get some kids to abstain from pre premarital sex and, and fine as far as that goes. But unless they are, they are plus R, unless they teach them how to get plus R and operate under those things, they are still evil. And yet, those people will die and go to hell and never, they'll see and they'll hear and they'll never understand what we're, what we're teaching uh, right here today. Now, verse number 7 of Romans chapter 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law has said thou shalt not covet. Now, Remember Star Wars again. Let me, let me illustrate with something that communicates to me. Star Wars. The Force. Now, the Force is, is um, the, again, the wrong. It's, uh, the, it's the, uh, the god of, of um, uh, those that uh, believe that there is an impersonal force out there somewhere that you tap into. However, they do have something right in that concept. And that is, there is a dark side of the force. 
Remember the movie? And there is a light side. What did Luke tell Darth Vader? He found out he was his, far, uh, his uh, father, and he, he looked at him and said, there's still good in you. I feel it. Come to the light side of the force. Come to this side. And Darth Vader said at first, before the end of the movie, he finally, he finally saw the light at the end. But before that, uh, he, he said, you just don't know, Luke, the power of the dark side of the force. But the whole movie was about eliminating the dark side and bringing everybody into the light side. And that the force was going to make everybody good without God if you just simply tap into it. Now, it's that concept that, that these religious people are doing. Yes, get rid of unrighteousness, but make yourself to the maximum self-righteous. That is the profile of the old sin nature, and that's the strategy of the devil, to get rid of unrighteousness, but bring in self-righteousness, so that God will have to say, I can't judge you because you're so good. And so our world, the, the driving force in our world today is world religions who are trying to bring us together under the concept of self-righteousness, but it's evil. And we're all so good. Uh, and they won't admit uh, uh, that, that man isn't good. He doesn't start off good. Uh, he fell from that goodness. And that the only goodness we can ever hope to have, God will recognize, is found in the person of Christ imputed to, to us on our behalf. All right, now, the profile of the old sin nature. I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. But what is Satan lusting after? Badness? No. Goodness. To be recognized as good, better than Christ, without being seen as somebody that is sinful. All right, that's what the old sin nature does. Let's, uh, let's move on. Here's the profile. Verse 12. The law is holy, the commandment holy, just, and good. This is divine good that God recognizes. Was then that which is good made death to me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is, is good. What, what, does, what does the sin nature do? The sin nature covets. Now, Lucifer doesn't want the immoral, and then we'll just put the, on this side a big I here. He doesn't want immoral coveting. Uh, even though that's rampant in our, our world uh, uh, too. God does not want, Im I mean, Lucifer doesn't want immoral coveting. That's unrighteous. But let me ask you this. Is there such a thing as moral coveting? Put it over here. The profile of the old sin nature is that you covet. Can you covet something that is, and be immoral? Yes. Can you covet something and be moral? Under the concept of evil, you can. Now in actuality, it's still immoral. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, come with me, there we're in Romans. Let's go to chapter number nine. Now, when I say it's moral, I'm talking about moral in the sense of, of in the um, uh, essence of evil. People covet. This guy said, I made a pact with God where I'm going to be so good, God's going to have to recognize me. I'm going to be moral. I'm going to do a good thing. Now, was he, in, in effect, moral and religious and, and, uh, and the like. Yes, he was. But was it wrong? Can you be moral and still be wrong? Yeah, look here. Verse number 30, Romans 9. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness. Now, what does that mean about the Jews? The Jews uh, uh, wanted self-righteousness. That's evil. They didn't want the righteousness of God. But the Gentiles who, who said, I don't know any better, when the righteousness was, of God was offered them through Christ, they said, yeah, boy, they gobbled it up. The, the, the salvation of God will be sent to the Gentiles and they will see it and hear it. Acts chapter 28. 
Why? Verse 32. Uh, uh, what? Uh, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. Did they lust after self-righteousness? Yes. Were they moral in effect? Were, did they try to keep the works of the law? Yes, they were moral. But, but in actuality, it comes up because there is a blend. There, there's a trend on either side of the old sin nature, and there is a blend together. Their moral lusting is immoral, but they don't realize that. I'm being good. Let's move on. Uh, verse number, uh, uh, let's go down here to um, verse 2 of chapter uh, 10. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That zeal was a moral zeal. Oh, the works of the law, I'm going to wash my hands and wash my feet and get all baptized and, and I'm going to offer the sacrifice and do all that. But they refused to believe the message of God through his messengers. They were moral and immoral. They were self-righteous but unrighteous at one at the same time. And they didn't lust after the, you know, the degrading parts of humanity. But did they lust? Yes. The chief characteristic of the old sin nature is lust. It can be self-righteous or unrighteous lust. It can be moral or immoral lust, but it's still lust. And it comes straight from the old sin nature that is active in evil. They, being ignorant of God's righteousness, went about to establish their own righteousness, but didn't submit themselves to the righteousness of God. Now let's go and look at Paul in Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Now, what we're going to do here is just, uh, just take a few mo moments. Uh, let me, let me see. Have to have to remember whether my pen writes white or dark because if I get a white screen, then I have to have black, and if I get a black screen, I have to have white, or you guys are not going to see it. Okay, I did good. Let's look at Paul, verse number four, and read on down. Though I might have confidence in the flesh, hmm, over here, flesh with the old sin nature. He had confidence in it. Pretty neat, huh? Do you know that every person in status quo evil must resort to confidence in the flesh for their salvation? That's what they're trying to do. They have to assume that they are strong enough and, and smart enough and, 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 and potent enough to bring about a righteousness that God will accept. And so they have confidence in the flesh. Paul said, if, if there's somebody who has confidence of, in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, he said, I more. Now note what he's saying here. It is powerful and it should instruct us again and again and again with regard to God has an anti-evil plan that we must buy into as well. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. He was related to the Abrahamic covenant. He was in the nation of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, the one of the two tribes we've been studying on, on Sunday night that stayed true to God the longest, Judah and Benjamin, the southern tribes of Israel. A Hebrew of the Hebrews, talk about zeal. Uh, he was numero uno, he was recognized, he got the trophy, the award. As touching the law, a Pharisee, in other words, these, these Pharisees tried to keep the law. But how was he doing all of this? In the flesh. In the power of the flesh. That's what he just told us. I have confidence in the flesh. Now, now watch what he says here in just a little bit. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. The flesh, according to the book of Galatians, hates those that are righteous. Well, as a matter of fact, here, we've got a minute. Hold your place. Come back to Galatians chapter 4. Number 28. 
Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of the promise. We're children of the spirit, not of the flesh. The very fact that you believed in Christ says you have no confidence in your flesh. Verse number 29. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. If you have somebody that is persecuting you who looks down their long self-righteous religious nose at you because you trust in the cross of Jesus Christ and you operate under the principles of God for today, you mark it down there, have confidence in their flesh, and they're operating under the coveting lust of, of, of moral degeneracy. Moral uh, self-righteousness. And that, that's what it is. They're operating in the flesh. They persecute those that are born after the Spirit and operate after the Spirit because the natural man doesn't understand, but the spiritual man does. But the spiritual man doesn't have confidence in the flesh. That's why he's spiritual and not fleshly. All right, let's move on. Touching the righteousness, that's why he says, I persecuted the church. Here's, here's my zeal. I persecuted actual saved people, believers. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. The law said it, and I did it. Or if I didn't do it, I offered the right sacrifice and got, got back in good stead with the law, not God, because he didn't believe in God uh, as far as God's true message for his dispens the dispensation. It took uh, the abundant grace of God to save this guy. Anyway, verse 7. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Get the picture. Here is the flesh. The Apostle Paul says, the I had confidence in the flesh more than anybody else. But once I came to understand what Jesus Christ is all about, all of the things that were profitable to me in status quo evil and confidence in the flesh and bringing about all this supposed self-righteousness, he said, I gave up. Yea, doubtless, verse 8, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but dung that I might win Christ. There was his estimate of the old sin nature in the flesh. And be found in him not having my own righteousness. So you get over here and you get the spirit. Well, I was afraid I was going to do this. I, I put some spittle on my, <laughs> okay, uh, it, it didn't seem to damage anything. Okay, he said, I don't, I don't want the flesh, what I want is the spirit. Be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the flesh, of the law. But that which is of, uh, that which through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so, we ask you uh, the question, and with regard to the sin nature, it has a, an area of weakness here, it has an area of strength here, but it has these tendencies which blend together. Now, uh, the point for all of us is, are we going to maintain status quo evil, trust in the flesh, or are we going to follow God's system?